Welcome to Bigfoot Case Files, true stories of encounters with Bigfoot. Female Bigfoot captures railroad linemen, early 1900s. I was told this story 20 years or more ago by my mother, who passed away in May of 2006. It came up in conversation during which we were not discussing Bigfoot, but she retold the story that my grandfather had told her and her siblings 65 or 70 years earlier. My mother told the story that was refuted by her and her siblings when my grandfather told it. These were children of the early 1900s going to school bi and trilingual as my mother told it. When grandpa told the story, they were convinced that he was telling a tall tale primarily because they all learned in school that there were no apes in North America. The story goes, Grandpa was working for Southern Pacific Railroad building track in the Northern California-Oregon border in the early 1900s. During this work project, he was dispatched to work on a line camp in the woods. They had a base camp that the work crew worked from, and each week, the work crews would split into two two-man teams that would work an area clearing logs and ground, and at the end of one week, they would go back to the base camp to check in and replenish their supplies, and then set out after the weekend for another week in the woods. During this time, one of the two-man teams came back to base camp with only one man. They were told that the other man had disappeared. The group at the base camp apparently gave a brief search to no avail. The next week, the crews went out in the two-man crews and continued to work on the railroad line clearing. Some weeks later, I'm not sure how long this was, as the camp moved north and the group of workers came upon the missing man. He was naked and hysterical, crazed, and apparently died soon after he was found. He told of being abducted by a female ape that kept him in a large open pit. During the time he was in the pit, the man told of being forced to have sexual contact with the ape many times and said that the ape kept him in the hole or pit by licking his hands and feet raw so he is not able to escape from the pit. Apparently, my grandfather saw this man's hands and feet and said that they were completely raw. My mother, sisters, and brothers laughed at my grandfather as someone who was uneducated and unable to understand that this was impossible due to the fact that there are no apes in North America. I always found this to be an intriguing story. John Lewis, San Francisco, California Mount Shasta, California Encounter I was an assistant caretaker with the Sierra Club Foundation at Horse Camp on Mount Shasta during the early 1990s. During the summer months, the regular caretaker, R.W. and I, used to take turns staying at horse camp during the weekdays so as to police the place and offer assistance to potential climbers on their way up to the summit. During these off days, we usually saw very few people at horse camp who would stay the night and climb the mountain the following morning. Normally, day hikers came to visit and look around, but then went back down before sunset. It was a Thursday, and I was waiting for R.W. to come and relieve me so that I could go down to Shasta City to take a breather, get some food, and find a shower. R.W. was typically late, so I decided to retire once I realized he wasn't going to show up. I don't remember what stage the moon was in, but a faint glow of light was present, so I didn't need to rely on my flashlight to get around. It was shortly before midnight, and I was in my tent, which I had set up less than 100 feet northeast of the horse camp hut. The area is a mix of stone and paths leading to other campsites and other trails to explore the mountain. After settling down for the night, I heard someone walk around the hut as stones clacked against each other. Knowing that R.W. was a big prankster, I yelled out his name a couple of times, but no response. Keep in mind, I spent a lot of time and nights alone on Shasta, so I never had anything to worry about, which means that I was rarely fearful of anything. When I got no response, I started to go off of pure instinct and the chain of events became vivid. The walking sounds were getting closer to the left side of my tent, and thinking about how vulnerable I was, I grabbed my ice axe in my right hand and slipped out of my sleeping bag, poised to open the mosquito flap if anything was going to go down. My heart raced and the adrenaline was pumping through me. Out of the left-hand side of the mosquito mesh door, I saw a huge outline of what I believe to be Bigfoot. The outline walked about 30 feet in front of my tent, stopped, turned, and stood facing me. At the time, I didn't think Bigfoot, but rather someone was up there to cause trouble. So I ripped open the door of the tent and jumped out with my axe in hand. 
I'm six foot three inches tall, and this being was much, much bigger than I. We stood there for a few seconds, and the Bigfoot turned away and slowly walked into the trees. Needless to say, I didn't get much sleep that night, but just because of the spiritual and peaceful nature of Mount Shasta, I didn't question my safety and life went on as usual, with my only regret being that I showed this entity such hostility by brandishing my ice axe. In hindsight, I believe the being was just passing through and meant no harm. I looked for footprints the following morning, but only found an area where it looked like something had a difficult time getting up a steep incline. I didn't smell anything since a small breeze was coming from behind me as we stood there face to face. I finished out the caretaking season without further incident, except for a group of thieving Boy Scouts from Sacramento. Michael Card Encounter at Lake Shasta Caverns Two days or so before, I'd been stationed alone at the entrance doing general cleaning while waiting for the bus to arrive with my next tour. I didn't think much of it at first, but there were rocks coming down the hillside and hitting the building. This became more frequent and disturbing as the area above was trees and brush, not likely just a rock slide. The number of times this occurred also became more frequent throughout the weeks. Then came a sort of rainy, cloudy day in March of 2001, I think, when I was on the mountain by myself. At Lake Shasta Caverns, we had tours leaving three times a day, and it was the last one of that day. From way up on top of the mountain, you couldn't see much, and I'd say the visibility was 300 yards or less. My tour arrived and turned out to be only two people, a male and female. The bus driver turned the bus around and returned to the bottom of the hill. As the three of us were standing there, looking across the ravine, talking quietly, we heard some rustling and distinct thumps on the ground. They asked me what it was, and I just kept watching the area it was coming from. As we were looking up and down the ravine 200 yards away, I never noticed before, but clearly visible, was a skid path that was spotted by the man on my tour. He had a high-powered scope-type camera and zoomed in. All the while, we were still waiting to see what was moving down the ravine at such a high speed and moving the tops of what I thought to be pretty large trees on this path. And out of the overgrowth, we saw it. It was huge, on two feet, arms clearly swinging wide in front of it and behind it. In a matter of two seconds or so, it was no longer visible, but we could still hear it. The thumping was its feet running downhill to the water of the lake. Straight down. The echo continued until suddenly a silence. I turned to the man and asked if he got it. He said, I don't know, I think so. I then immediately ran for the emergency radio we keep in the storage employee room and called down to the bus at the bottom. I told them what we all saw and to be careful and get up here. We want to go now. My boss then came across and told me to calm down, get inside the building and wait there for the bus. When we got back across the lake to the main gift shop, I exchanged numbers with the people on the tour, but my boss kept theirs, and I have not gotten anything from them from that day. The only thing I know about them is that they live in Santa Rosa, California somewhere, and were on vacation. I quit my job as a tour guide there shortly after, because I wouldn't sit up on that mountain by myself ever again. It's a peninsula with no roads, houses, or people, 30 miles west and 10 miles east of pure nothing accessible only by boat. Perfect habitat, I would say. Investigator Brian Zance conducted a telephone interview with the witness. She has a clear recollection of the sighting and added some interesting details not included in the initial report. All three witnesses saw a large black figure moving rapidly on two legs down the side of the ravine toward the lake. The witness noted the figure's arms were swinging as far as its strides. She described the path it was using as well-worn, like where a log had been skidded. It was the rhythmic thumping which the witness later determined to be the sound of the creature's feet hitting the ground and the shaking of the trees and bushes that drew the attention of the witnesses to the break in the foliage where they briefly saw the figure. In recalling the events, the witness noted that the increasing incidence of rocks and sticks hitting the building at the cavern entrance, which she referred to as Unit 4, took place during the weeks before the sighting, but only when she was alone. At that time, she was the only female guide on the staff. She also reported experiencing a feeling of being watched while there and occasionally experiencing unexplained fear. This was particularly noticeable at the end of the day, after she had finished her last tour and had to lock up the entrance and exit of the cave by herself. She also reported noticing a strong smell of death 
similar to, but not quite the same as, a decaying animal corpse coming down off the mountain on occasion as well. The witness also said that she was raised in the mountains of Northern California and that she was not afraid to be alone in the woods, and that these sensations of fear were unusual for her. It also may be significant to note, as the witness did in her initial report, that there's no access road to the site from the land side. It's very isolated, located about halfway up the face of a rather rugged mountain. Tours leave from the visitor center and cross the McLeod arm of Lake Shasta on a small ferry to a dock on the east shore. From the lake shore, a bus takes you up a series of hairpin turns on a steep one-lane road to the Unit 4 building at the cavern entrance. Woman describes her two Bigfoot encounters. On the 18th of May, 2005, the witness Penny called investigator Richard Hucklebridge and they went over her two sightings. The first one taking place during the late 1970s in the Tahoe National Forest and the last one took place in the late 1990s on Lake Shasta, California. Her first sighting, which took place in the Tahoe National Forest in the late 1970s, was off on a dirt logging road that was off of Highway 89, about halfway between Truckee and Sierraville, California. She and a friend were camping in that area that was newly planted with seedling pine trees. The time was at dusk, and they were trying to cook dinner before it got too dark. She was sitting on the tailgate of the station wagon when she looked past her boyfriend and into the old-growth pine trees, which were about 50 feet away or so. She said that she was surprised, but wasn't scared. This five-foot-tall creature was just standing there on two legs watching them and had its arms down along its sides. She noticed the eyes because they were really round and they reminded her of the eyes of monkeys that only come out at night. The creature was covered totally with hair, which was a dark brown to black. The arms seemed much longer than a human's arm because they extended down to its knees. Penny said, because of the creature's size, it was not a child or an adult, and thought it weighed about 150 pounds or maybe a little more. She couldn't tell if it was a male or female, and it never made any noise. As she was attempting to tell her boyfriend to turn around slowly to see what she was seeing, the creature just melted back into the forest and out of sight so he never had the opportunity to see it. Her total time of observance, she figured, was a couple of minutes, more or less. Sometime during the early morning hours, the driver's side of the station wagon was hit with enough force that the vehicle was rocked from side to side, and it scared the living daylights out of both of them. Just after that occurred, the both of them had to relieve themselves, but neither of them wanted to go outside of that station wagon. After some time had passed, they went out and quickly returned back to the safety of the station wagon. The next morning, they checked out the station wagon, but couldn't find any signs of where the vehicle was hit. They also checked out the area where Penny had seen the creature, but couldn't come up with any prints or tracks in that area. The second sighting took place about a half-hour boat trip up the Pitt River arm of Lake Shasta, from the Jones Valley Resort, where they put their boat in the water. It took place sometime between the months of June and August in the late 90s and between the hours of 11 a.m. to 12 a.m. Penny and her now ex-husband was slowly trolling for bass heading up the Pitt River arm of the lake and there was a rather steep incline on the right-hand side of that section of the river. Penny said, I first observed this massive creature walking down towards the lake and as I watched it, it took the last three or four large steps to the water's edge. The creature then bent down, and with its left arm, it pulled something out of the lake and was looking at it. To me, what the creature had pulled out of the lake was some kind of a fish cage or trap made out of small tree branches. The trap seemed empty, and at this point in time, the creature was about 50 yards or so away from our boat, and I attempted to alert my ex-husband as to what was taking place on shore, but when he looked in that direction, he couldn't see what I was looking at. Penny continued saying, this creature was covered with hair, and the color of it was a dark brown to black, which blended into the background real good. Due to its color and the background, this made the creature seem like it was almost camouflaged in plain sight, and very difficult to see. Anyway, the creature then placed the cage or trap back into the lake, and turned and walked back up a very steep incline into the foliage, which was about 75 yards away from the water's edge, disappeared into that foliage, and was gone. I thought the total time that I had seen the creature was at least several minutes long. The creature seemed unconcerned with the boat and its occupants, which included myself, 
my ex, and our old dog that was very upset with whatever was on shore because it was raising heck by barking and howling really loud. The creature never looked in our direction, but it had to have heard the ruckus the dog was making. It never paid any attention to any of it, and it just seemed unconcerned and went on with what it was doing. Penny continued, I thought the fish cage or trap was made out of small branches or sticks, and it was placed at a small river outlet that was entering into the lake at that point. I knew what I was looking at, a Bigfoot, and it was huge, about 8 feet tall, and it had to weigh well over 375 pounds. The creature's legs and torso were also huge, and I thought the head was nicely proportioned to the rest of its body. It was too far away to see any facial features. I didn't notice any ears on its head, but the arms were large and long, like they were at least down to its knees, and they were a lot longer than any human that I know about. I never heard or smelled anything out of the ordinary, and we did move the boat closer to shore to where the creature had turned and went back up to the forest, but we never got out of that boat. I think these creatures are more human-like than they are like animals because of their mannerisms and some of the different facial expressions that I observed on the little one's face. Also, the way they moved when they walked and while they used their arms and body. Plus, the big one who was using something like a fishing trap to obtain its food has got to tell you something. Penny observed several facial expressions on the little one's face, from extreme interest while watching what was going on, to fear when she told her boyfriend to turn around. Thanks for listening. I think you might find this video of interest as well. If you've had an encounter or sighting of a Sasquatch and would like your story told here, please email me, Lynn Smith, at bigfootcasefiles at mail.com. I'm looking forward to hearing from you.